All of the Fretboard Journal podcasts are brought to you by a few presenting sponsors. First up is Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone. Then we have Carter Vintage Guitars over in Nashville, where guitar lovers go for a good time. And we have a brand new presenting sponsor, Calton Cases. Your custom instrument deserves a custom case. Thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I'm Jason Verlindy, the founder and publisher of the Fretboard Journal Magazine. As always, that's John Rauhaus playing in the background. And today, I'm sharing with you an amazing conversation I had with the one and only Nels Klein, one of the great guitarists of our generation. Before we get to that, a quick reminder, the Fretboard Journal and everything that we do, everything that I do, is powered by all of you out there, our listeners and our readers. I'm not rolling in ad revenue. So if you want to support what we do, if you love the podcast, if you love our online content, if you love the videos, you love the ideas of a fretboard summit or a guitar magazine that speaks to you and doesn't try to dumb anything down, support us. You can get a digital subscription to the Fretboard Journal for just $30 for the entire year. You'll get four issues. Or if you want the keepsake coffee table book, edition of the fretboard journal magazine that we've been doing for 15 years now it's just 44 dollars for four issues delivered straight to your doorstep i also want to remind you that we have two other podcasts that we produce here luthier on luthier where michael bashkin has a deep dive chat with fellow guitar makers once a month and then the truth about vintage amps podcast where i get to hike up my pants and sit on a couch and play ed mcmahon for an hour or two every single week while Amp Tech Skip Simmons is your Johnny Carson, and he fields all your questions about tube amp repair, maintenance, Mexican condiments, and God knows what else. Tune into that. We are 56 episodes into that, believe it or not. And then I think we have two more podcasts coming in January, completely different from everything else that we do, and I'm really excited to be sharing those with you as well. So Nels Klein is on the podcast today. I consider him a friend He and I and the magazine go way back. This is not the first time he's even been on the podcast. We had him and Julian Lodge on the podcast, I think episode 80, that was. God, that was a while ago. We've also run features on Nils over the years, of course, including his work in Wilco, his collaboration with Julian, on and on. That first Blue Note record he did, Lovers, I've told so many people about that record. I still listen to it constantly. That song, The Bond, continues to make me tear up every time I hear it. I love everything that he's done. He's been on the cover of the Fretboard Journal 37. He did it. He actually wrote for us. He interviewed Ralph Towner, one of his guitar heroes for us. Uh, Anything we can do to to celebrate Nels, we will do. I'm going to include links to some of that stuff in the show notes. You're going to want to click on that because some of that stuff has never been online before. And it's all really amazing stuff. And... uh, The reason I'm talking to Nels today is because he just put out a new record on Blue Note, his third Blue Note record. It's called Share the Wealth. It's it's definitely his wildest Blue Note record to date. Nels has put out some pretty wild recordings, though, over the years. He started out, as you will hear, trying to make sort of an Os Mutantes-style cut-up collage album, and then it morphed into something else entirely. It reminds me a little bit of those uh, Miles Davis electric recordings that are just like... You can feel the heat coming off of your stereo when you play them. I love those. Um, and I guess, as you will hear when in this conversation, we owe Fish a thank you for this record. That's how they kind of had something to do with it, which you'll hear about. Thanks, Mike Gordon. Nels and I talked, I got to say, on the worst day imaginable to do an interview or much of anything productive. It was November 4th, 2020, the day after the election in the U.S., so we didn't really know what was going on with the world I guess we still don't know what's going on with the world. But uh, we were a little preoccupied, but we got through it, and we had an amazing chat, and I hope you love it. I want to do give a shout-out to a couple of brands that do love us and do want to support us and are our sponsors. First up is Mono Cases. Mono makes some of the coolest gig bags and pedal board bags and studio monitor stands imaginable. Everything they do is so cool and so ergonomic and so well-built. And so I hope you'll go check them out at monocreators.com. We also are sponsored by Folkway Music, home of Canada's finest vintage and acoustic guitars. It's owned by frequent Fretboard Journal contributor, guest, celebrity, Mark Stutman, 
who we thoroughly love. He's one of the great experts when it comes to repairing vintage acoustic guitars. And if you're not following Folkway Music on Instagram, you need to, folks, because you will learn all sorts of stuff about the minutia of old Gibsons and Martins and how repairs get done. It is fascinating stuff. So go check out that. The latest Fretboard Journal is Fretboard Journal 46, featuring John Leventhal and Roseanne Cash, Hubert Sumlin, Mark O'Connor, guitar maker Steve Grimes, and so much more. If you order anything from the Fretboard Journal store online, it'll ship out in about 48 hours directly to you, and you can have the option to start a subscription with the new issue or the latest issue if you want. So please support us. This is our 15th year. I want to thank you for checking us out and being a part of our community and for listening to me every week on this podcast. Keep the feedback coming at podcast at fripboardjournal.com. And uh, we have some fun episodes coming up, so you're going to want to stay tuned by popular demand. Night Bob is coming back on the podcast in about two weeks and uh, a lot of other surprises. So with that out of the way, here's my chat with Nels Klein. Again, the record is called Share the Wealth. It's on all the usual places, and you definitely need to go check it out. Nels, thank you for uh, chatting with us. The, you know, the last time we had a real interview was around lovers, and I specifically remember you telling me, like, this is the only time I'll ever be on Blue Note Records. <laughs> They'll never want me back again. And uh, here we are again, another Blue Note record. That's right. I'm three for three. Yeah. Thank you, Jason, by the way. It's great to uh, be able to chat with you again. Of course. Uh, I've I've loved all of these Blue Note records, and uh, I got to say, this is the wildest. This is the, I, I can't even wrap my head around how it came to be, so if you want to fill me in on, on the origin story of this record, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Well, um, I'll give you one of my typically long-winded stories. Uh, Response to your question. Um, as you were probably aware, I've had this band called the Nels Klein Singers for quite a while. It started out almost 20 years ago as a trio with uh, Scott Amendola on drums and electronics and Devin Hoff on electric and acoustic bass and uh, sort of drifted along for about 10 years as a trio until Devin decided to move on to other aspects of life, both musically and personally, uh, at which time Trevor Dunn came in on bass, probably one of the only people in the world that could really replace Devin Hoff because of they both, well, they're both really good friends uh, and have a bass duo, but uh, they're all people who can play masterful acoustic bass in the, jazz and classical manner and also play uh, exceptional uh, incisive and sometimes extremely hardcore electric bass so they're perfect for for my music uh, but i was still unsatisfied with the trio format i, I maybe unsatisfied is a strong term it was i was getting restless and uncomfortable being the main voice all the time mm-hmm. And uh, I needed something else. And I really thought at least if I could get some extra percussive color in there, I would relax a little bit. And so we made a record called Macroscope, uh, which is, I think, the the first one that Trevor played on. And that's now been years ago. But uh, I really, really wanted this percussive flavor and uh, one of the two percussionists was Ciro Baptista, who I was quite aware of from his work in New York and with many different people, including that he had worked with my wife, Yuka, and, and that he can bring that um, color and excitement and a certain degree of madness to the music. Uh, so I asked him if he would come and play with us and tour with us, and he actually did, uh, which turned the group into a quartet and was a remarkable experience unto itself. But then uh, Michel Levasseur at the Victoriaville Festival in Quebec uh, asked me to do an expanded version of the singers. Um, And uh, I came up with a, this was a few years ago, I came up with a version that uh, included uh, not only Scott and Trevor and Ciro, but the amazing Brian Marcella on keyboards, 
whom I had heard uh, when Yuke and I did a duo gig at the kitchen and he uh, opened solo. And then he and I later played together when I was a guest with Ciro's band, Banquet of the Spirits, one of my favorite groups. Um, just I was just uh, playing with them at the Stone in Manhattan. Uh, anyway, I also added Zena Parkins, with whom I've collaborated on and off for maybe 20 years at this point. Um, she was playing her electric harp and uh, Mark Rebo on guitar. Uh, I knew that Mark was going to be there with Ceramic Dog, so uh, and he and I had collaborated on some duo gigs and a trio thing with Bill Frizzell and or that was a quartet with Shazada Smiley on drums and bass. But uh, so I tried this expanded version of the singers, but it was only a sound check rehearsal and then go kind of situation. Mm-hmm. So we didn't quite get our 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 land legs, but it certainly fired my imagination. There was no way I was going to get Mark Rebo in the band, but <laughs> <laughs> but it was I love having two guitars. Um, so flash forward to last year, uh, and I ended up playing on one of these uh, post fish concert jams that happen when they have a residency as they did at Madison Square Garden. Uh, and the first one I got asked to do was this one with uh, Skerrick on saxophone and effects and Mono Neon and Billy Martin and me. And Skerrick and I had known each other or at least met maybe 18 years ago and would encounter each other on the West Coast when I was out with maybe Scott Amendola band or the singers and he was doing one of his bands and we'd be on shows together, festival, something. But I'd never played with Skerrick. So uh, playing with him was really, really fun. And there was something about not just his use of effects pedals, which certainly dovetails into my sort of sonic realm in some uh, cases, but just the, the power and directness of his playing uh, just, it, it, you know, it was pretty riveting. So, uh, and it was Scott Amendola who he had not only, Scott had not only suggested Trevor, uh, when Devin departed, but he also suggested, uh, when I described how much I enjoyed playing with Skerrick, uh, that we do more because Skerrick's a huge fan of my music, which I didn't really know. So uh, I, I just thought, what if, and I put all these people together and flew them to Brooklyn and recorded for a couple of days to see what we would get with some material. Um, I had these ideas of improvising and taking chunks of it and creating this very compressed sort of psychedelic, almost prog rock kind of uh, jazz rock record. Um, But I wasn't sure exactly where it was going to go because we never played a gig and we had very little time. But we did it. We did it and my friend Eli Cruz engineered and co-produced with me. And then he and I got together and did some uh, computer magic. You know, there are things where I kind of wanted a little more here and a little less there. And certainly the improvisations needed to be uh, edited because they wouldn't fit even on a double album. So, so uh, uh, I was actually stunned by how much I love the improv, improvised, improvised pieces. Uh, uh, this took on a whole different cast at the record um, when I started realizing how much I was enjoying these improvised uh, forays. Uh, and so I hacked it all together with, with Eli and presented it uh, through my delightful manager, Liz, uh, to Don Was, who said, let's do this. And, uh, and I'll be honest, I thought what he was going to say was, wow, this is really, really great stuff. Now, this is probably not a blue note release you know so i was stunned and of course extremely pleased uh but all the records i've done now for blue note i didn't realize were blue note records until i was either done or halfway done in the case of the nels Klein four where i had recorded what i thought were demos of a handful of pieces that i uh played for him and and he said, yeah, let's do this. And I thought, whoops, okay, now we're making a record. <laughs> so most of that record, well, half of it is uh, from those so-called demos. And then I just re-recorded a song on that and added a couple of new ones. And we had an album there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how it works. 
and now I have this double album, yet another album that's quite long <laughs> of mine, uh, and uh, and an aesthetic that I think is, um, I guess it's very jazz rock. You know, I mean, it has its softer moments, it has its smooth moments, but it also has some pretty extreme moments, and I and I guess that's kind of how I roll. Yeah, I mean, it, it's got that, uh, I mean, it's even wilder, but it's got that electric Miles Davis thing going, but then there's all this other stuff happening, and I think I heard a theremin yeah. and all sorts of other stuff. Maybe it wasn't a theremin, but... No, no theremin, but but, but uh, certainly the, the piece on the record called Princess Phone mm-hmm. uh, is a direct Miles homage uh, to that era of Miles. Um not just the 70s or late 60s miles, but even 80s, uh, you know, like Star People, Decoy. Uh, these records are still important to me. Uh, and I just thought it'd be fun for this band, like that we would just know how to do that. You know, I'm not saying it's any kind of cool killer song. It's not the most important composition in the world, but it's just another excuse to figure out how to play together. Uh, and uh, and I did do some crazy edits on that to uh, throw people off the scent there with the Ciro and Scott uh, manic exchanges at the end, which were certainly not originally part of my compositional idea. Uh, but I just thought it'd be a fun way to end it and, and uh, maybe a little bit jarring, which is, yeah. you know, innocently jarring. Yeah. No, it, it, it's fantastic. What what was the Thanks. what was the under? You mentioned that a few of these were were pure improvisations, but what was the underlying structure of the rest of these songs? What did you come to the studio with? I mean, in my head, I'm almost picturing like a John Zorn game thing of you holding up cards of this is how I want this to feel. But but what? How did the actual studio mm-hmm. sessions well, go down? Well, I mean it. The, the pieces I brought in, uh, two of them don't even include the whole band. They were ballads that I had written. Uh, and, you know, I've mentioned this a few times in interviews, and I'm not trying to get people to, like, I'm not trying to upset anybody or direct too much attention to this, but they weren't really written for the whole band, and they were ballads that I had written to come to terms with a friend's suicide. And those are uh, Nightstand and Pass Down. Uh the other material that I had, one of them was a piece called Share the Wealth, which is the name of the album, mm-hmm. and I thought it would be a great album title, but the piece didn't make the cut. Um, I just wasn't really happy with it, but uh, both compositionally and performance-wise, uh, I didn't push for a specific thing. I just recorded it. Like As I say, I, I kind of, in my mind, think of the, thought of these as demos, potentially. Um, but uh, I had this piece which at the time I was calling it uh, as a working title, not as a real title. And that's Beam Spiral, the second mm-hmm. track on the record, which is the most produced track. And uh, and I think kind of definitive. And that was the first single so-called, as uh, Blue Note calls them, uh, that came out with an accompanying video that my wife Yuka made. Uh, and then, um, and I had this Titano song called Titano Beloso song called Segunda from the Gal Costa album Recanto uh, that I wanted to, to open the record with. I kind of knew that in, in my mind, this is a great opening because it's just a nice solid drone jam with some soloing, every, you know, introduction to the orchestra kind of thing. And also a song that I just love. Uh, and then I had uh, the piece called Headdress, which is by smooth sort of dub uh sumptuous you know like drifting in amber kind of groove number uh inspired by all kinds of stuff when i think uh back on it i know i was very inspired by uh both um jeff parker and his new breed music but also esperanza spaulding from her 12 little spells uh monster work um and but recently we're just sitting around watching videos that we enjoy and realize that uh flying lotus coronas the terminator is also another uh maybe a jumping off point 
Um, but that's, in, when I think back on it, that's really all I think I brought in, oh, and Princess Phone. Uh, both Princess Phone and Passed Down had more composing, uh, more writing, uh, and I edited out this excess <laughs> mm-hmm. in post-production, where I just was like, what was I thinking? Passed Down had this whole B section with all these Ralph Towner chords, and I just sounded overwritten to me, so I just chopped it all away Eli and I chopped it away um and the rest was improvised and there were just there were no instructions for the improvisations other than the one that I ended up calling a place on the moon where I just said to everyone space the rest of them all had (laughs) uh bpms as the only parameter like beats per minute Mm -hmm. uh, in a click uh, in our headphones I mean and uh the amusing thing being that the longest piece, which is track four, which I just decided to call Stump the Panel for some reason, uh, was a very long improv uh, that was supposed to be at some, I would just say to Eli, Eli, you know, it's 99 or something, and he'd put 99 BPM in our phones. And that the idea was that I was going to just use tiny chunks of them and collage them at some point to make a, a, a very... Uh, Know, potentially kaleidoscopic and and somewhat jarring musical experience, but uh, Scott forgot to turn his click up at all, so he started playing this whole other groove. <laughs> We're all looking at each other, like, "What is happening?" Uh, so we just turned our the click down and, and soldiered on, and all this cool stuff happened. So the improvs that you hear, which are uh, the Pleather Patrol, a place on the moon, and stump the panel are edited and there are some strategic mutes because I wanted the you know listener to be able to potentially uh, listen more than once <laughs> or at least have desire to hear it again you know so I'm trying to make it a nice listening experience uh, but it had to be they had to be shorter anyway as I say but I didn't change the sequence of uh, any of them in terms of the trajectory or the, the course of events was un, unchanged. You know, we lop off the first three minutes of growth or, or this part here maybe went on too long or whoops. Now we have to actually edit this just to fit on a, uh, any kind of format that's physical, you know? So even when I thought I was done, I ended up having to remove a few minutes from stump the panel uh, just because I wanted to include, and so did Eli, we wanted to be sure to include this little piece I'd written in the studio called Ashcan Treasure. This was really just exists because I wanted to hear my dobro with Brian's toy piano and create a kind of uh, moment of repose or a palate cleanser, you know, just a kind of break for the listener. And then everything timed out really perfectly uh, for vinyl, which was quite a pleasant surprise. And uh, and I and I do think of the whole thing since I'm old and listen to records quite often in their entirety uh, as as quite a journey. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's how it worked out. You you mentioned uh, one of your original thoughts on this was to cut up some of these improvisations and kind of glue them back together, collage style almost. And then you mentioned editing out a bunch of different, you know, parts that you thought were extraneous or, or weren't, weren't going to please people. Do you enjoy that sort of post production editing process? Is that fun and interesting to you or is it painful? No, it is interesting and it's pretty new for me. I think if anybody out there is, familiar with my uh, recorded output, particularly from the uh, Nels Klein trio to the singers, um, my records definitely are too long. So um, even though this one's too long, there was an amazing amount of time (laughs) spent um, happily, in my case, listening to these pieces and just trying to figure out what to do with this, uh, what in many cases is raw material. You know, this could be something cool or it could be something that's extraneous and and approaching it multiple times. So, uh, and I think maybe 
this process uh, started to become more relevant from working with my wife, Yuka, and, uh, and our, our music and seeing how she works, you know, because she's very much a, a, a studio kind of person and a computer person, a technology person, and a, a, a groove, warm groove, you know, tone person. So uh, it's funny to think that I was maybe using these kinds of parameters and then still ended up with a record that's too long, but, or whatever, it might be long. It's not too long to me, but you know, I have an attention span, um, but, uh, but it's not painful at all. It's actually uh, at times puzzling and at times just a fun puzzle, you know, and Eli is just so savvy and so down that he works really fast. So I don't, didn't have to go through some, you know, arduous, elaborate discussion with my engineer who doesn't understand my lingo, you know, Eli and I are on the same page and he just, he just leaps in. I give him latitude also. I ask him questions. Is this working for you? Is there anything you'd like to add? He, he shuffles around the imaging, you know, uh, uh, he, at the, through the whole session was running a channel of, uh, I guess, monitor material into I think one of his, uh, into some kind of a vintage delay or, you know, he really loves vintage synthesizers. So he was doing stuff just in case we could use it. And I don't even remember right now how much of that, if any, got used. I know there's a tidbit here and there, but uh, Scott's always sending information from his pedal board uh, that can be used or not used. And uh, same with Scarrick. So we've got his dry sound of his tenor. And then he's, when he wants to send effects, they're going direct and we can use them or not use them. Uh, there's just a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah it sounds like <laughs> we it. Really, we really maxed out the studio, especially just space wise, because Brian had, uh, he had a Hammond organ, a Farfisa organ, a couple of synthesizers, uh, a Rhodes, and acoustic piano, and effects. And Ciro has his massive, uh, you know, beautiful world. And that alone took up most of the main room. And this is a pretty big studio for Brooklyn, uh, the bunker. And then uh, Skerrick in his world, and then Trevor and Scott in another uh, ISO booth. I was in the main room with Ciro and Brian, but we had to run a lot of stuff. Uh, well, not a lot of stuff, a certain amount of stuff direct, um, like the roads and then reamp it later because there was just no way. Ciro's right there. You can't, you know, we wouldn't be able to mix effectively. So, uh, but that ended up being really fun. It's, it's such a puzzle. It's amazing. Uh, trying to wrap my head around how this all came together. You, you mentioned that you, you had to cut or you decided to cut the, what would have been the title track of the entire record. How many hours of recordings were there versus the, the almost two hours that made it to the record? Oh, not that many more other than the fact that there was a lot more improvising that's not included. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have any more songs, just share the wealth that was maybe seven or eight minutes long and uh geez i don't know maybe another half hour or so of, of improvised chunks mm -hmm. um i can't really remember now there were there were certain improvised pieces that straight off the bat i once i realized i wasn't doing this collaging thing uh that didn't really hold my interest so it was easy to sort of let them go you know i already had what i thought was an embarrassment of riches <laughs> <laughs> got it and if we were to be a fly on the wall or if there was a gopro or something are you doing much conducting while you're playing or is this just what happened from each individual little pod no conducting i think only conducting i can recall uh was well maybe two instances one was just cueing the head coming back in on Segunda, <laughs> you know, on a melody, like anyone would on a gig. Like we didn't set how many rounds, basically on that piece, I solo, then Skerrick solos, then Brian solos, and we do this around and around. I think it's maybe four times, 
but we didn't set how many times. And I think we only did two takes of the song and that's take two. Um, so I had to cue the recap. And then on uh, uh, Beam Spiral, I conducted in this early day, I think, I, I conducted Scott Adola drum approach at the end by making massive arm movements at one point, which I think was his cue to, as Mike Watt would say, foam it up. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, like like just just go for it, you know. I don't remember conducting a single other thing. Got it. You mentioned. Uh... I'll be honest. I'll be honest, Jason. I didn't even know what the role of guitar was was in this band when we started recording it. I hadn't sorted it out at all. I realized that I was confronted with a problem uh, at one point, and I should probably play some more guitar. You know, <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't really thinking of the guitar as being a, a pivotal element in the music at all. I was just thinking of this, uh, trying to get a couple of the pieces done and then seeing what we would do. And, and that's why I think the, I find it difficult to do uh, cogent or sensitive uh, improvisation with headphones on, for example. I've, I've in the past found looping uh, or even hearing pitches and overtones properly, uh, I've found that can be very challenging in headphones. And I I'm generally try to issue headphones as much as possible whenever possible. Um, but we had to use them in this session, and it didn't seem to be an obstacle. So the results uh, of these improvisations um, were doubly startling to me, I suppose, just because I, in the past, found it difficult to muster uh, that kind of communication or nuance or or even comfort, uh, being comfortable uh, in headphone world. Uh, I don't know what this has to do with what we were talking about. <laughs> no, it's okay because uh, you mentioned you didn't you didn't know the role of the guitar and. That makes me think oh, of right. of the uh, a composition you wrote for lovers that uh, I can't stop obsessing over the bond, and I know you were uh, you were arranging that for a much larger kind of orchestral setting. Maybe was that right? Uh, I mean, the, the original piece of the bond was for me and Julian play. So, uh, but yeah, of course, uh, once we were thinking of it in, uh, as an orchestrated piece. Um, probably more strings were in my head, yeah. but I think we doubled them. I think we just had them play twice and did the illusory thing that they do on so many movie soundtracks and sweetening sessions. Uh, if those still happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think initially the bond was just a duet in my mind, not just in reality. Um, and the most daunting thing about doing it on the lovers record wasn't, uh, doing it as an orchestrated piece, but it was that I had to solo at the end instead of Julian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, Julian would just go off, you know? I mean, when we do it as a duo, he was, you know, cause we played it in your office. Yeah. Um, he would just go off and that was part of the exhilaration, but you know, I wasn't going to have, he was still on the record on, on lovers, but I was, I had to play the solo because it's for my wife after all. Sure. <laughs> yeah, oh, it, yeah. The end of the record. It's my damn record. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what whatever I was going with that is um do you want to start doing more composing that you don't even play on? Well, uh maybe. I don't know. You know, I have all kinds of weird neuroses related to notated music. Um, I'm very bad at reading it and rather than being courageous and trying to overcome the psychological damage inflicted on me as a teenager <laughs> regarding this, I caved and have feared it and shunned it for most of my adult life and have a barely functional uh, grasp. And yes, I can write music, but I still find it difficult to actually sit down and start writing it even when I know what the piece is and that it's done, you know, for example, I was, I was uh, lucky enough to get a 
a grant to write and eventually perform music with my Brooklyn-based quartet uh, that has only played together a couple of times, um, called what I call the concentric quartet with Tom Rainey and Chris Lightcap, uh, Tom Rainey on the on drums, Chris Lightcap on the acoustic bass, and Ingrid Laubrock on saxophones. And uh, so I, at the beginning of this isolated era uh, or moment in time, I was sitting around playing guitar a lot and ended up, you know, writing a bunch of tunes. That's what happens when I sit around playing guitar since I don't know how to practice. And uh, I still haven't written out any of it. <laughs> but there are, I have something like 12 pieces and only two, two areas uh, on two pieces that I haven't absolutely confirmed um, melodic or arrangement content. And, but I'm still just sitting around playing them on guitar and I haven't written them down yet. So I have a, a, a weird phobia or some kind of neurotic uh, reluctance in this area. So writing pieces for others to play um, that I'm not participating in seems almost cruel to me. <laughs> but I do, but I, do, I do imagine music that doesn't have me in it quite often. Uh, and maybe, maybe someday, you know, I don't know. How how are you preserving these twelve songs you haven't written out? Or do you have voice memos or something for them? Yeah, exactly. Got it. I just have millions of versions of of me playing these sections into my phone. And uh, what is your guitar when you have these little uh, moments of inspiration right now? Oh, it's been my uh, my little late '50s uh, Dan Electro convertible. I'm obsessed with this guitar. This guitar is on the new singer's record. It's the guitar on "Pass Down," the last track, uh, where we mic'd it acoustically and used the pickup sound to combine them. Mostly, it's acoustic sounding, and it's also uh, an overdub on "Being Spiral," where I strummed along with my electric guitar strumming just to give the, the strumming a little more percussive uh, amber. And I love this guitar. Is that really, a- really love it. Now, now that we've sort of semi moved more stuff into this space that we're in, I do have more guitars around than I did. I only really had two guitars when we left Brooklyn months ago temporarily and that was my Novo Mirus and uh and my Dano and uh the Novo Mirus is a guitar that Dennis Fano gave me it's an incredible guitar and I brought it along because it's a hollow body guitar because it's it has these Lindy Fralin hum canceling P90s so it's doesn't hum which is always important to a lot of people uh and it's very versatile. You know, it has a certain amount of edge, but at the same time, it can be smooth. But now I have a lot more guitars here. <laughs> Where did the, I don't, all the times we've crossed paths and I've been to your, your spaces, I don't think I've seen the Dan Electro. Is that a recent purchase? Yeah, yeah, I got it last year. Um, it's something that uh, um, Mr. Tweedy and I have discussed the virtues of the, Dan Electro convertible together at certain points. And I'd always said like, wow, I always wanted one of those. And of course, uh, both Jeff and I are very aware of uh, the amazing stuff that Alan Sparhawk does with his convertibles. He, has, he goes on stage with Boo and he has a whole weird, some kind of like voodoo system of trying to control the feedback. And he's got big pieces of tape positioned in special spots and uh, he and I have discussed this, but I don't have a clue as to what it is he's thinking and why and how he does what he does. But then Jeff sent me, uh, you know, a picture on reverb of this Dan Electro. Uh, it was very cheap and it looked like it had been played to death. And so I bought it and took it over to Tom Crandall, who did a neck reset. And it's absolutely, I find it absolutely magical, to be honest. Incredible. Was the neck reset more than hmm. the uh, the guitar itself? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was maybe half. 
yeah, but okay. but uh, wow, it was just uh, it, so I love it. I really really love it. And but now I have a little flock of acoustics around because uh, I send a bunch of guitars to um, the Wilco Loft. Um, it's it's embarrassing, but how many it was, I'm not sure exactly. But there's a lot. But my acoustic guitars are not of no use in Chicago in the, in the Wilco world, because uh, not only do I rarely if ever play acoustic guitar in Wilco at this point uh, or ever, uh, Jeff has an astonishing array of acoustic guitars in the loft. So yeah. it would just be absurd and they'd be, you know, a thousand miles away from me. Uh, so I, I have some nice, some nice stuff here. The other guitar I wanted to ask you about is the one you mentioned you you wanted to get into a, a tune the dobro what what's the story with your dobro oh well i have more than one of course because i'm obsessed with resonator guitars i really am but the one i used on the record uh i don't know if they still have it on their website but if you go to tr crandall guitars um there used to be a blog about uh, tom crandall's uh, rebuilding of an old uh, national Dobro, and I'm sorry, I don't even know the model number, and I can't remember the year because I I just don't I, I rarely uh, internalize these details with any sort of uh, I guess accuracy or care. But um, it was owned by a man named Curtis Rogers. Nobody knows who he was, but the guitar patina is um, extremely distressed. This guitar was played and played and played. It has a painting uh, of a woman who is ostensibly Curtis Rogers' wife on the front of the guitar, mm -hmm. and it still has the jute, a uh, piece of jute that he used as a strap. Uh, and Tom lovingly recreated the fingerboard, which has the name Curtis R painted on it, and, and lovingly replaced all the uh, bedazzling that, that he had done on the neck, which includes rhinestones and, and such. Um, so that's the guitar that I used on Ashcan Treasure. Uh, and it has a remarkable tone. It has a remarkable vibe. Uh, something that was at T.R. Crandall that I had no right to own, to be honest, but it, it just, uh, it's, it, it is nothing like this. No, we don't even know how the biscuit never went flabby because it was obviously played to death this guitar uh, as the only guitar this man owned um, and he played a lot mostly uh, the first five frets <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, uh, but I have it and uh, and I used it <laughs> I should make a whole record on it just to justify owning it you know I mean I do feel sheepish about things like this um, yeah, but it's it's a remarkable sounding dobro, for sure. And what were the other main instruments of yours on the record? Well, there are only three. There are uh, my '59 Jazz Master that I call my New York Jazz Master. That uh, it's an early '59. I, I think there's a picture of it in the article you guys see on me. Mm -hmm. um, it's even more distressed now than it was then. And then. Uh, there's another jazz master that's a fake jazz master that I use a r astonishing amount in my work on the East Coast. Uh, I use it with Cup, the duo I do with Yuka. I record a lot with it, and I played it with Ben Goldberg's band Unfold Ordinary Mind. And the reason is because it has Seymour Duncan PAFs in it disguised as jazz master pickups. Uh, my friend John Woodland, um, Woody from Mastery Bridge, Mastery fame, mm -hmm. um, put this together for me years ago from a vintage body that had been lying around Willie's American guitars for years uh, and a vintage tremolo and the Mastery Bridge and a kit neck. Um, it finishes what I politely call Band-Aid. Um, and so I had that for moments when I didn't want um and I didn't need single coil tone you know it sounds a little more sg like i guess mm -hmm. but it has all the accoutrement and joys of a jazz master uh in every other way and then i had the dano so those were the guitars i used 
Got it. What about amps? Uh, just the same amp I always use. Uh, uh, well, no, I sometimes use a smaller amp, but this was my studious Mosley, you know, studious, the tiny company out of Chicago, a young man named Brian Howe makes them. I use a, a studious Mosley with Wilco the last few years. The Wilco amp is a piggyback with two 12s, and this one's a combo with one 12, and it's, I've had it for years. Uh, there were a couple of overdubs done on the record post-production, and on those I used my uh, studious Selye, S-E-L-Y-E. All his amps are named after scientists. And that one, the Mosley is like 21 watts, I think, and the Selye is 14. Both of them have 112. I think the Mosley has a Weber in it, and I can't even remember what the speaker in the Selye is. The Selye is uh, I like to point out um, the cabinet itself is aromatic cedar. So, it, you know, moths don't like it. That's good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, they're just really beautiful, simple amps, you know, with, with not too much treble and some low mids. That's what usually what I'm looking for is some headroom, some low mids, not too much treble, and not a lot of knobs. Yeah. Does your pedal board, you, how did you shape that leading into this record? What did you bring? What did you leave at home? Uh, I just, uh, you know, I just brought the big one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the big one ha is a split pedal board that just stacks into a Pelican case. So it's what I use with the singers uh, prior to this recording. It's what I was using on cup shows with Buca. Um Maybe going out to um, maybe the big jam, the post fish jam. I might have brought the whole the whole thing. I don't even remember now uh, when I jammed with Scarrick and we did one later with uh, with John Medeski and Scott Metzger and Billy Martin. And, um, but it, you know, it's got a, the, the a lot of the stuff I use with Wilco are used with Wilco that I just kind of part of my scene with the volume pedal and the compressor and the fuzz factory and the the overdrive in this case was a Seymour Duncan 805. Um, you know, the Quan Centaur is just too big <laughs> for New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I guess they're not really valuable. I don't really care about that, but it just takes up way too much space in, in spite of the fact it rules. Um, and uh, the Boss Vibrato pedal and the Whammy one, you know, I like the first Whammy the best, um, mainly used for detuning the guitar or for maybe a low octave here and there um not used for whammying <laughs> you know that's that can be done really well but i, I just don't you're going boring, boring, boring. i'm not doing that yeah um uh delay you know a little boss delay and uh electro harmonics pulsar um what else is on there uh debbie ever sodomizer and a little clean boost from crazy tube circuits in Greece and a waterfall chorus pedal made by jam pedals in Greece. And uh, there's probably some other stuff that I'm miss missing at this point, but that, and then of course the, the old electro harmonic 16 second digital delay and my chaos Two chaos pad, which I use for fake tape delay effect, either space echo or echo plex. And, uh, Neun Aber Immerse Reverb. When you were recording this, which I'm assuming was way pre-COVID. Uh, it was a year ago last May. Okay. Yeah, even further back mm -hmm. than I thought. Uh, was the yeah. original plan to, to take this ensemble out on the road and, and play these, these tunes in person? What a good question. I'm not even sure I can answer that question because I think always yes, but then at the same time with two guys on West Coast band and knowing uh, the landscape of, uh, shall we say, um, offers, fees, promoters, and uh, general uh, abstruse music making semi-popular if if maybe lacking in popularity, I'm not sure I could actually do it, but I certainly would like to. 
Yeah, it'd be amazing. It's it'd be a little amazing. impractical. <laughs> yeah, it'd be amazing to see how these these uh, these tracks unfold though live on the second and third and fourth dates. It'd be it'd be really cool. Oh man, well yeah, and and uh, now that you're asking this question, I did remember that I specifically uh, asked Trevor to only play uh, electric bass instead of bass and acoustic bass, you know, like uh, which he was doing with the singers and which let's face it, having the acoustic bass is a huge obstacle to touring. Uh, whether you're borrowing one nightly or trying to travel with one, it's just a huge pain and not super fun for uh, cherished bass individuals. So I just wanted to keep it on the bass guitar for the practicality of touring and also just to see, you know, how that would go. And I think that adds a, a very specific identity to the record itself. Just the fact that Trevor's playing bass guitar on the whole record, which yeah. he's crushing. Um, and then what's going on with the, the Old Town School in Chicago? You, I know you have an event there virtually. That's December <laughs> yeah, virtually. It's December 2nd. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be hard pressed to give you the uh, course title at this point. But basically what I want to talk about with people, since they asked me to be rather specific, uh, is the role of sound, timbre, tone and tunings in both songs. And by songs, I mean maybe singer-songwriter type songs, classic song structures, uh, pop songs, and improvisation, um, in which case we have to, at some point, I suppose, address the decision-making process and uh, the idea of listening while playing uh, when improvising. Um, but I don't want it to be a theory class, even though I'll probably mention chord names or something, but, but uh, I kind of want to address the idea of how sound on the guitar can create a signature on a song, in a song, that can be absolutely crucial and how that is not necessarily a technical, shall we say, you know, finger wiggling technical uh, gymnastic event. It can be the exact opposite. It can be one strange gesture uh, with everything plugged in wrong that changes the direction or or creates heightens the identity of something. So I'm just want to kind of create an open uh, and all maybe all embracing idea of discussing these elements as my experiences uh, have have come into play like with these ideas you know it sounds pretty deep is this something you think about a lot no not not necessarily work for myself but certainly um recording with wilco this is a um something that's always always there to think about and address uh and and uh and i think a lot about overtones i think a lot about uh, improvisation, what what kind of decisions one makes and why one makes those decisions. And in my case, it's quite often uh, a result of me listening to what someone else is playing, assessing uh, what timbres uh, or timbre that entails, where it seems to be going, and what notes maybe are being played. So I think, you know, having at least relative pitch and some interval training is helpful in that area. Um, but that's different from contributing, say, to a recording of, of a song that basically got three chords, um, you know, one, four, and five on an acoustic guitar and now being asked to, you know, do something with that. That's, that's can, that can be a real challenge. Um, and some people, like if it's Jeff Tweedy, he can do it himself. <laughs> anyway, but he also knows what he wants and doesn't want. Quite often, people don't have an, uh, any idea at all, or they want you to do something that sounds just like something else. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about why I think, for example, so many people will ask me to play like Mark Rebo on the Tom Waits song at a certain point in my life. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just because uh, 
the song was cool and had a cool guitar thing. It's because the guitar th- took the, the song to a whole other level for people and it astounded people, uh, it surprised them. And so you just never know, you know, you just never know. Yeah. I could go on, but I don't want to. No, save it for the <laughs> class. Um, speaking of Wilco, <laughs> you mentioned Wilco and I know the Wilco headquarters has most of your guitar collection right now, but, uh, is there anything <laughs> brewing on that? Have you even been able to see those guys? Oh, no, uh, no, we, uh, we had our tour, uh, in March, uh, we got the plug pulled when we were in Calgary, realized that we were not only going to not play Calgary, we were going to not play anywhere and uh went home um well we'll go home to chicago and then i was driven back to brooklyn and uh so no i mean I've, we've had zoom chat and um I, I think we'd love to have some kind of um, record in, in case we can do solid sound in july i think we'd like to have a record and certainly jeff will have plenty of songs to toss our way, but it's going to have to be created uh, separately and we'll see how that goes. Um, but I think that it, ultimately in a way it won't change a certain kind of production methodology that Jeff and, um, and our man Tom Schick use, which is to say that I'll just, for example, just speaking personally here, <laughs> I'll just uh, submit a bunch of ideas on whatever Jeff sends out and that's what everybody else will do. And then Tom and Jeff will just sift through and, and uh, use what they like. And that could be uh, another really cool Wilco record, you know, but that process is as yet to be instigated. Got it. Well, you um, a... But see, you could can record me here. Yeah. I was so, going to ask, do you have a studio uh, that you can, you know, little, it's not really, I mean, she has a little, little room with all her stuff and I'm basically recording most of the stuff direct and it's, we fooled a lot of people so far. Um, they probably think I'm using some cool amp or something, but I haven't, I haven't recorded an amp yet. Fantastic. No, I did actually a little bit with the, uh, rock and roll fantasy camp. What I was playing was, was mic'd and I was playing through a, a little, you know, ZT lunch files. And, uh, and this way I didn't have to wear headphones to do it. You, you've mentioned that twice now, so I have to ask about it. I, I don't normally think of a Nels Klein being at a rock and roll fantasy camp. What was, who else was on the camp and how did that come to be? Oh, it's just, you know, it, it's something that I wasn't really aware of it in a specific way. It's something that's existed for, for I, I mean, years and years. Yeah. Um, and it was a camp you know, uh, until this. And I guess like these, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, there's a really, really nice, uh, man named Jim Felber who invited me and he's working for them. And, and then they, I said, sure. And they contacted me. And then I realized that I'm on this list with, uh, like Ted Nugent yeah. <laughs> and all these kinds of people that do this. And they're like big rock dudes and, uh, and their graphics are super rock, you know, uh, but it, it was a Zoom thing with 25 paying uh, participants. And uh, I think each, I did two in a row. And, and uh, it was mostly a Q&A situation. And I played a little, talked about myself uh, as, as an introduction. And it was extremely pleasant. And uh, even uh, recognized a couple of friends of mine in the, in the, zoom crowd <laughs> uh so it was just an invitation that came along and i said uh, okay sure i will i will say though that when i saw uh their announcement for other things and the photo they were using of me um, i looked all like super uptight and legit so i i asked them please to not use not not disseminate that version of their publicity quite yet and then i appealed to uh wilco's uh, one of the two photographers that quite often uh, comes out and shoots our shows and whatnot, uh, Zoran Orlik, and said, do you have any shots of me like really rocking out? <laughs> 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 so, 
So he used this real badass picture of me doing controlled feedback with the guitar neck on my amp, with this making of some horrible face. So I did try to actually kind of fit into the uh, the font that uh-huh. they use for Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, which is which is pretty, uh, you know, um, rock. Yeah. Well, you, and it was fun. And yeah. it was fun. You, you could have told people you were wearing leather pants, but the Zoom camera just wouldn't show it. You know, or something like that. No, no. My new thing now is no pants. Hey, that's the thing. That's what. That's what. That was the thing that uh, I guess when it started was a, on all these news uh, broadcasts and stuff that was going around. I think it was either John Oliver or one of these people that that did this connected this thread of all these people talking about whether they were doing their broadcasts wearing pants or not. So now I just tell everybody I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> Although I did actually do, uh, you know, uh, one of our good friends who's in our COVID bubble is Sean Lennon and and his uh, partner, Charlotte Kent Moore. And so we did, a, you and I participated in their version of a T-Rex song, um, Mambo Son, for uh, a James Corden show. Yeah. And, uh, and um, so I played drums. And in my underwear. Why not? <laughs> See, it's that, it's that dignified thing that everyone knows to, to uh, associate with me. Mr. Dignity. <laughs> Dignity. How'd you get the name Nils? My grandfather's name on my mother's side. I never knew the man. He died when I was uh, but an infant. His name was Nels Nelson, although originally coming from Denmark, it was Niels Nielsen. And for some reason, the United States of America was canceled, taking eyes out of names that day. Uh, and so that's how I got the name. Got it. And uh, anything else on the horizon we should chat about? I know we've been preoccupied. It's well, the day the- after uh, everybody voted, so. Yeah, I know. We're still like numb. I don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Shuddering. I don't know what we're doing. We're waiting. Yeah. Uh, holding our breath until we pass out. Um, well, I mean, in February, there will be some kind of performances and a recording with the, uh, where I'm uh, playing a Douglas Cuomo piece. He's a composer and lives in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, so it'll be me in a string quartet and I don't know more information on that as it gets closer. Cause that's not till February. Mm-hmm. So that's basically what I've got. What about, you know? uh, are, and, you, are you and Julian, is there anything in the works or just too hard to schedule and figure out now? Well, you know, Julian and Margaret are in Nashville now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but we did get to see them because Julian came to New York to do some uh, recording for John Zorn. And so we did get to have a little like socially distanced dinner on our roof of our building. And that was like a magical uh, cosmic event. Yeah. Uh, and so the idea going forward at this point is to make a, uh, some more duo recordings, um, which is what we both miss a lot. I miss it. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life. And um you know, the Nels Klein four was our sort of experiment with the idea of a rhythm section in our duo. And always, I think, in both of our minds, that kind of a shelf life, you know, mm-hmm. particularly because we're both so busy doing all the other stuff, or we were. Um, but the duo will live on. And so whenever we can, you know, I mean, Julian has a new record coming out next uh, spring mm-hmm. with his trio. So we could do it the way they did it, which was to, you know, get tested prior to the session, you know, uh, and just be mindful and distanced and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and then, yeah, maybe we'll do a duo recording be of great. some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would love to. Uh, final question. What what music are you playing right now on your stereo? Oh, wow. Well, we don't really have a stereo set up. I guess 
Um, it does. Uh, well, you know, I listen. I've got a handful of things. I'm still, I still listen to CDs and whatnot. I say I have a megaton of vinyl, which is all now storage. Um, but uh, I really have been enjoying John Schofield's uh, recording called Swallow Tales of mm-hmm. Steve Swallow compositions with yeah. Steve on bass and Bill Stewart on drums. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just classic go. And of course, those tunes are wonderful. So I've been enjoying that. And, you know, uh, you and I are always listening to Caetano Veloso uh, his, his entire career. Quite often while we're making food, we either have on Caetano or we have Thela Kuti um, grooving. Um, what else have I? Uh, Mary Halverson's uh, Code Girl record, very intriguing, uh, with Robert Wyatt as a guest singer on some stuff. And uh, anything Mary does is of great interest to me. Um, that's somebody I'd love to write about for your magazine. I'd love um, it. Yeah. I think Elliot Sharp wrote about her years ago for guitar player, though. So he kind of got the jump on me. Elliot's always a step ahead. Yeah. But anyway, uh, what else? Um, hmm. My mind always goes blank when I get asked this question. I'm about to listen to Ingrid Laubrock's uh, brand new record called Dreamt Twice, Twice Dreamt, music for chamber on orchestra and small ensemble. And her uh, composing is incredibly uh, intense and, and uh, it's very overwhelming at times. And I'm really curious what she did this time. Um, she's remarkable and I actually like listening to uh, um, Tom Rainey the drummer and his wife Ingrid Laubrock uh, play duo a lot and they stream things from their apartment and just listening to them play has been really a joyful experience Mm. Uh, and you know I'm sure once I stop talking to you I'll be able to come up with uh, quite a list of things that I've listened to. Something you know, people send me stuff uh, with with links to Bandcamp or uh, whatnot, and every once in a while I'm able to remember that they sent them since I'm old and don't <laughs> often think about downloads. <clears throat> so, for example, my friend Paul Riola sent me something. He's a, uh, a wonderful woodwind player in Denver. Uh, uh, that he had recently done. And of course, now that I'm talking about it, the name of it escapes me as Dave Devine on guitar. It's really cool. Um, that's all I can think of right now. Jason. That's okay. Oh, I'm always listening to, you know, Jim Hall, man. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, Jimmy Jufri three and Jim Hall, uh, trio or Jim Hall, anything. I mean, that's always like, a a way for me to uh, be simultaneously inspired and assuage anxiety. Bill Frizzell's new record, um, Valentine, I listened to that. Yeah. Uh, it's on Blue Note. So listen to his trio with Rudy and, uh, and Thomas, you know, that's a real pleasure. You guys are label and Julian's now. record, which, yeah, I know. And, and Julian too. So, uh, uh, Listening to Julian's record, which no one's heard yet, that was a real pleasure. But that's now me lording my fabulous life over people, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> but hey, I got to hear Julian's record <laughs> <laughs> with Dave King and Jorge Roder. It's good. I bet. Well, Nels, mm. thank you so much. I love this record. I uh, thank I you. Love talking thank to you. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah.